John 14, 14, about three verses before today's gospel where Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Now that verse from John's gospel is rather difficult for lots of Christians. And that is because there have been many times when we prayed for something and thought we didn't get it. Why doesn't it pay off? I mean, he says right there, whatever you ask for, I will grant it. And of course he does, but often we just don't have the faith to see it. As preachers for generations have been saying, God always answers prayers this way. Yes, no, not yet, or I have something better in mind. But believe me, that kind of preacher double talk does not always satisfy the disappointed person praying. So we have to look at the qualifier in the verses from John 14, 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will grant. That phrase, in my name, means that prayer will be processed through the greatness and holiness of God and answered. Several centuries ago, a person named Coventry Patmore put it this way, God usually answers our prayers so much more according to the measure of his own magnificence than of our asking that we do not know his boons to be those for which we besought him. And that lofty 17th century English means God answers our prayers with so much more fullness, that is, in his name, that we often do not recognize that he is answering our prayers even when he is. And here's where Easter comes in, and this is what I want to preach on today. In his name means processed through, immersed in, changed by the resurrection of Jesus. In Easter season, we are not just celebrating a once event resurrection of Jesus. We are celebrating the resurrection life for all creation. Christian life is passed through resurrection. Our prayer life is passed through resurrection. Our love is passed through revolution, uh, resurrection. Indeed, humankind's evolution is passed through that resurrection. So much Christian life is passed through resurrection, else how on earth would we be able to survive all those tragic Good Fridays of our lives? The prayer book Colic puts it in these words, God who gives us more than we desire or deserve. This we need to be aware of because until we are aware of it, two problems can happen in the life of faith. The first is, if God and his church don't live up to our expectations, we can just dump it and go out and live our own life and control that, or so we think. I was a teacher with Los Angeles Unified for 20 years, and I used to work with a lot of people who have no use for the church. It's full of hypocrites. It only attracts the weak and the unstable. It's not what it's cracked up to be. God didn't fulfill their expectations, and neither did his people. So let's just flush it. Now, all of us have heard this, and to be honest, from time to time, most of us have felt that. But Christian life means we trust God to be doing things in his way, the resurrection way, even though we don't understand it. Because to chuck the whole thing and say, I'll do this myself, leaves us open to selfishness, bitterness, anger, hatred, and the nursing of grudges. But instead of preaching forever on that, I have a true story about prayer and the Christian life that often comes nibbling to my mind since I have noticed that there are many times that we prefer the funeral of our own making to the resurrection of God's making. So here's a story. It's a good, true tale offered up by my brother in South Carolina. It is in the commencement address of Judge Alexander Sanders of the South Carolina Court of Appeals given at the college graduation of his daughter, Zoe. 
He told a story about Zoe when she was three years old. It seems that when Zoe was three, her pet turtle died. The judge came home from work to find a crisis in his household. Zoe had been crying all day long, and she was crying as if her little heart would break. Her mother had given up, so the kind old southern judge took over. First, he promised he would buy her another turtle just like the one that died. That did not work. Little Zoe cried even louder. Then he began, he said, to think like a lawyer. So he said to little Zoe, Zoe, honey, we'll have a funeral for the turtle. Now, it was obvious three-year-old Zoe did not know what a funeral was. So he expanded on the theme using his lawyer's diversionary tactics. A funeral, he continued, is a great festival in honor of the turtle. Well, Zoe didn't know what a festival was either, and so the judge wrote, I began to depart from the lawyer's tactic of diversion to engage in the politician's prerogative of outright lying. A funeral, he told her, it's like a birthday party. We'll have ice cream and cake and lemonade and balloons and all the children of the neighborhood can come over to our house and play. Hmm. Zoe's tears began to dry. This sounded interesting. She said, all because the turtle died? Yes, honey, all because the turtle has died. Success. At last, Zoe's tears were banished. She was happy, yay, she was joyous at the prospect of this funeral, all because the turtle had died. But then, alas, something totally unexpected and unforeseen happened to spoil it all. Father and daughter looked down, and lo and behold, the turtle began to move. He was not dead at all, just doing some turtle hibernation thing. In a matter of seconds, the turtle was crawling away. The politician father, for once, was at a loss for words. And little Zoe, poor little Zoe, could only see that party, the balloons, and the cake, <laughs> all flying out the window just because that damn turtle had come back to life. <laughs> Her lip began to tremble, but then inspiration struck, and her little eyes narrowed into slits, and she crooned to her father, oh, daddy, let's kill it. <laughs> so it is in human life that being disappointed by not having our expectations met when our prayers are answered in a far bigger way, we find we prefer the funeral to the resurrection. Let me tell you how we do that. Once upon a time, while I was teaching for the school district, I had been affronted, I mean truly affronted, by another teacher in the morning. And being unjustly dealt with, I was justly sulking. I wasn't going to go anywhere near that person and thus punishing her for her affront. That sin, incidentally. <laughs> Then in the afternoon, I suddenly remembered the story of Zoe wanting to kill her turtle, and it suddenly hit me. Bill, you are enjoying the funeral. Why not opt for the resurrection? So I went upstairs, told the teacher that it hurt my feelings about Zoe's turtle, and we made all things right again. Resurrection via forgiveness and acceptance had entered in. God is always answering our prayers in Jesus' name. We just have to love him enough to listen and look. We have to learn in faith to avoid punishing God and his church because it didn't live up to our human expectations. We've got to love the resurrection more than the funeral. And when that happens, we can forgive, we can love, we can rejoice, and we can live abundantly even though life presses hard upon us. And the second problem we have about prayer in Christian life is that prayer is sometimes answered from a totally unexpected direction and from a different place. 
there is an old hymn that begins with these words, sometimes a light surprises the Christian when he prays. We need also to accept that we may be surprised by Jesus. I could preach a long story on that too, but instead I'll tell you just one last story. Once a lady missionary to Africa retired and returned to America. Poor thing really had very little money, but she always trusted in God. As she was getting settled into her small efficiency studio apartment on the second floor of an inner city neighborhood walk up, she was opening her mail. And sure enough, the first letter she opened was from an old friend and the letter contained $10. As she read the letter by the window of her simple apartment, she was distracted by the movement of a shabbily dressed man below her window. He appeared forlorn and without hope. Figuring that the poor man was in greater financial need than she was, she put the $10 in an envelope and wrote on it, don't despair. She threw it out the window. Man picked it up, read the note on the envelope, looked up, waved, smiled, and went on his way. The next day came a knock at the woman's door. There stood that very man with a very large wad of cash in his hand. As he handed that cash to her, she asked what they were for. To which the man replied, it's your share from the racetrack, lady. Don't despair, paid out 20 to 1 in the second race. Now, I admit that my stories may not be the stuff that religious movies are made out of, <laughs> but it is my hope that 20 years from now, when I'm long gone, the little smile may cross your lips at unplanned times, as you remember perhaps Zoe's turtle or a horse named Don't Despair. And maybe remembering those stories, you'll open your heart to Jesus a little more, remembering to let him surprise you, choosing the resurrection over the funeral, and knowing deep down that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And in his Father's house, there are many rooms, and one of them is yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.